Good evening. It is a true joy to worship with you tonight, to have our two congregations joined together as one, even as we are one in the Lord. This evening, uh, I'll be reading from a very familiar passage of scripture to you. I'm sure that uh, many of you even have it memorized, Psalm 23. Before I do so, let us uh, go to the Lord now in prayer. Almighty God, we do thank you and praise you that in this world you have not left us as orphans, but that you have given to us both your Holy Spirit and your most precious Holy Word. And we ask now, O Lord, that the treasuries that are found in your Word would, uh, would be given to us, and that uh, our faith would be strengthened even as we hear this Word and hear the Gospel through it. O oh, Father, we pray that uh, though it may be a very familiar passage, make it, O oh Lord, uh, fresh, that we may see our true Savior, our good shepherd, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. amen. So Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23 is called a psalm of confidence. These psalms are, are uh, sung, not necessarily when the victory has come, but rather uh, they articulate a confidence in God, even though help has not yet come to us. Uh, and we need these psalms of confidence because we are often cast upon blustery waters. And in our trials and in our difficulties, God often seems absent, doesn't he? I think that uh, we've all felt that. Where are you, O oh God? We need to be reminded, though, as the psalm here before us reminds us, that he is always our abiding shepherd. He never forsakes us. He never leaves us, but that he is present with us. Indeed, our confidence in a good future is not, therefore, founded upon our circumstances. It's not because our bank accounts may be padded or because our retirement our accounts are, are growing or because we or our children or our loved ones are healthy, nor is our confidence built upon a secure job. Our assurance is founded, it's grounded in, in the sure character of our God and of his power to save us. And so this evening, I want to draw our attention to this psalm yet again, but uh, I'm going to follow the three key statements here that David makes. So he says, I shall not want. At the beginning of the psalm, in the middle of the psalm, he says, I will not fear. And then at the end of the psalms, he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These three statements, I will, I will, I will carry us to the one promise that if God is your good shepherd and if he is your host, you will not only have everything you need, you'll have more. So again, David asserts here, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the emphasis, of course, here is that I shall not want because Yahweh is my shepherd. The job of a shepherd was to protect, to provide for the sheep. And that's why it was often used as, as a figure or as a picture of a king. A king was, uh, in, this, in the scriptures, are often called the shepherd. And, and it certainly was the title of Messiah, the chief shepherd. But uh, the, the shepherd was one who provides. He's the one who protects. So let's let the metaphor set in our hearts a little bit. 
Uh, imagine yourself in Israel. Israel has two seasons. It has a dry season and it has a wet season. And imagine yourself now in the dry season. There hasn't been much rain for about six months and uh, the grass has died off. There isn't much water. You're tired. You're hungry. You're thirsty. And not only that, but surrounding you are all these wolves and, and vicious enemies who are also hungry and thirsty and tired, and they're looking at you to be their next meal. Now you're vulnerable, as well as being hungry and tired and thirsty. But you're not out in the fields alone. You have a shepherd. And because you have a shepherd, there is no need to worry. And David reminds us that our shepherd is none other than the almighty, omniscient, omnipresent, very rich and gracious God. And so you will abundantly be protected. Every need and every spiritual longing will be met and fully satisfied. In the New Testament, again, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd in, in John chapter 10. But in the sixth chapter of John's gospel, uh, uh, the good shepherd declares this. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. That's a good shepherd providing for his own. And, and so what does the shepherd do? Well, he says, he restores my soul. Now, literally, the Hebrew word there can be, he, he, my soul he brings back, or my soul he returns. And, and again, see yourself in the desert. See yourself there in, the, in this dry season, panting in thirst, weak in hunger, dizzy from the heat, fearful of dangers, wearied from the hardships and the harshness of the desert, gasping trying to fight off death. But then the shadow of the good shepherd falls upon you. He reaches out his hands and he brings your soul back from the jaws of death. That's the picture. Now, we think of uh, soul as being that spiritual part of our humanity. We have a body and a soul, a physical and a spiritual part of our personality. And, and indeed, um, the soul is that. It is a spiritual part. But but for the Hebrew mind, soul, nephesh, is, is far more reaching just that spiritual part, you see. Uh, go back to Genesis chapter 1, and you'll recall that in the six days of creation, God made everything. In the last day of creation, that sixth day, uh, he had already made uh, all the animals and all the plants and all the fish and all the birds and, and the sun and the moon and the stars and all these things. But now he stoops down personally and he takes a bit of clay and he forms it into just the form that he wants. And then the Hebrew is very poetic in the way it pronounces it, but that he breathed the breath of life. And that bit of clay, that, that dirt, became a living soul. Dust became alive. The clay became animated. The soul is that seat of life then. It, it contains the appetites and the desires and, and the, the will and the inclination and the uh, emotions and the devotions of a person. It represents the whole person. So that if you have a soul, you have life. If you don't have a soul, there is death. And so David here says, God restores my soul. And, and what he is saying here is more than just that God brings us back from the jaws of death, you see, but that he satisfies our life. He satisfies us so that we are truly, really alive. And how does he do that? How does he restore the soul? How does he bring our souls back? How does he return our souls? Well, he says here, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. 
And so again, we're, we're seeing how this poem is asking you to picture yourself in the dry season where there's no grass, where there's no water, there's only barrenness, there's only dryness and desert. And, and your soul is withering up and it's experiencing a leanness and perhaps even anxiety. Suddenly, we're brought into a verdant valley where there's this lush green grass and these cool waters. How does your soul respond? Ah, oh, it's alive. A moment ago, thirsty. A while ago, hungry, dying. You had need, you had wants. But now, you have life. Life is given back to you, and all that you need is there now given to you, and you are satisfied. Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. Everything I need is given to me. You know, as we end this year and as we uh, go into a new year, um, perhaps some of us here in this room tonight are, are feeling a bit dry and, and thirsty and perhaps hungry and life has not been easy life has been in fact harsh and it doesn't look like in the next couple of weeks or year that anything is going to get better well here's good news even for you tonight Yahweh is a good shepherd and he knows his sheep by name now listen when when he knows you by name it isn't just that he can identify you in the crowd that means that he knows your person he knows the depths of who you are he knows you from the inside out he knows his sheep by name and he will restore your soul he will not let you perish he will not let you perish it may be that he will let you be in that desert for a while. He may have you stay in the harshness of the, uh, of the desert for a time. And in that, you might feel faint. You might feel like your life is ebbing away. But he has his purposes. He has his methods of dealing with each one of us. And he will not abandon you. He will not let you go. See, Psalm 23 is not just a lovely poem. It's a promise. It's a revelation of God's character. Psalm 23 is a prophecy of what he will do. And what will he do? He will bring you to green pastures. He will bring you to quiet waters. He will restore your soul. He will provide for you in all that you need. It's an amazing thing in the New Testament. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, one of my favorite sentences, is that Jesus turns to his disciples and he says this. He says, it is the Father. He said, do not fear, little flock. Do not fear, little flock. The good shepherd is talking to his sheep. He's talking to his flock. Do not fear, little flock. Why? Because it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sometimes we think of God as a stingy ogre who we have to beg and scrape to get anything from him. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, to give you the fullness, to bring full satisfaction to you, to bring an inheritance of glory to you. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you these things. You don't have to fear. You know, in, in the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said another amazing thing. In chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel, he says, look at the Gentiles, and what are they looking for? They're looking for food, and they're looking for clothing, and they're looking for drink. And it's natural because they're worldly, and that's all they have is this world. And so they're looking for the things of this world, food and drink and clothing. And then Jesus says, but you, you should seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And your father will give these things to you. I always found that to be an amazing statement. Not only is the Father going to give us the rich reward of heaven itself and the glory of, 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 of heaven, the glory of the kingdom and the full satisfaction of all that he is and all that he has, but he also says, I'm going to add to you the other things too, the food, the drink, and the clothing. Do you think that your good shepherd will lie to you? 
Do you think that he will lead you astray? Well, here David is pointing you away from the circumstances of your life and, and of all that's going on in the world. The world is a very tumultuous thing, isn't it? And again, he is here saying to us that our confidence in life is not established by how well the economy is doing. And right now, I just heard that the economy is doing fantastic. The president is promising everyone a job. But my security doesn't lie in the fact that I might have a job tomorrow. It's not because I'm healthy or my family is healthy. My confidence is in God, this all-wise, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, all-loving, ever-present God. He is your shepherd. And again, he provides all that you need, including the necessities of life. Listen to Psalm 34, verse 10. It says amazing things here. He says this, the young lions do not lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Now, did you catch that? Young lions, what are they? They're the picture of vitality and of and a strength, right? Young lions are the king of the forest. But for all their strength, for all their ability and agility, they suffer hunger, they suffer lack. But those who seek the Lord, those who have Yahweh as shepherd, shall not be in want of any good thing because he is taking care of us. Indeed, in, in David's old age, he said, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. Well, I was young and, and I am now old. I can say that now. And my white hair is, is a proof of it. When I was young, the Lord took care of me. When I was young, the Lord provided for me. I've given this testimony several times, but uh, my wife and I had to live on $200 a month for quite a while. $200 a month. I don't know how we did it, but the Lord provided. He took care of us time after time after time. Now I'm old. My testimony hasn't changed. Like with David, I have not seen the righteous forsaken. Well, verse 3 goes on to say, he guides us in the path of righteousness. Now, when we think of righteousness, we think of uh, terms of ethics and morality and, and those kind of categories. But I want you to stay with the metaphor. Uh, we, are uh, we are the sheep. And what do sheep never do? Well, sheep never sin. <laughs> and uh, therefore, they don't have to be led in, in, in paths of moral righteousness. Now, of course, we are... That's just a metaphor, and of course we need that too, don't we? But this word righteousness can mean not just what is right, but what is honest or what is truly beneficial and good. And so what I think David is getting on here is that the shepherd will lead me not just in the right path, but in the beneficial path. Now, some of you tonight might have a moral decision to make. You might have a, an, actual, a, a, an ethical question looming over your head. And you need guidance. Well, praise God. He's given you his word. And his word teaches us everything that we need to know who God is and what duties he requires of us. And so you can go to the word. You can go to your elders. You can go to your pastor. And you can ask for guidance. And you can ask for help. And we will dig through the scriptures for you and with you. And, and we will try to help you in those moral categories of need. But not every decision you make is a matter of sin or righteousness, is it? Not every decision you have to make is a matter of right or wrong. Sometimes it's a question between good and best. And what David is here saying is that God will guide you even in that because he's absolutely 100% sovereign. Even if you're not 100% sure about your decisions, you can be confident because God, your shepherd, will guide you and carry you along just the right and beneficial path. 
And so, yes, I want to encourage you to seek out godly counsel. It's wise to do that. Study the Bible for wisdom and Christian principles. But understand that as you make your decisions, whether they be big or small decisions, know that God, your shepherd, is leading you. He's directing you. And he'll never let you go. That doesn't mean that you can't do something foolish. Because you all have done that, haven't you? It doesn't mean that you'll never fail. Because you'll do that too. But it does mean that uh, your shepherd loves you and that he will never let you go away from his ultimate plan for your life. That plan, by the way, he decreed before the foundation of the world. Because he is the sovereign, wise, and good shepherd, he causes even wrong choices and bad decisions to turn around to bring you along those paths of righteousness. Hebrews 13 says that sometimes he may have to discipline us. But you know, that discipline isn't a bad thing, is it? That discipline yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And, and uh, Calvin this morning, I, I preached from Romans 8, 28. A very dangerous passage of scripture for me. <laughs> but a very comforting one. You know, Romans 8, 28 actually flows from Psalm 23, verse, 30, uh, verse 3 here. I remind you, uh, Romans 8, 28 says, we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. In verse 3, he says that he guides me in the path of righteousness. I don't have to worry. I may fail. I may fall. I may go down wrong paths by my decisions, but he will turn those things around. He has in my life. And he will do in yours. And that's what David is saying here. David was not a perfect man. David made mistakes. He made terrible mistakes, and it cost dearly. But God even took those and used it for good for both him and for all Israel, and even for us. Now, how can I be guaranteed that even when I make a bad decision and, and a foolish turn, that God will bring ultimate good and victory out of it? Because, David says, he is doing this for his name's sake. That means that he is doing everything, including rescuing me from my bad decisions and all my trials, for his own glory. You know, the glory of God is that which gives purpose and direction to the universe. And so whatever God, uh, whatever role God has for you to play in this world, because he is your shepherd, you'll have everything you need to fulfill that purpose. And though you may blow it, do not fear, because God must remain faithful to his name, and nothing can derail his purposes. Even your failings must work out together for good. That's why God said in Isaiah 48, verse 11, to a sinful people, that he was going to exile, bring out of the land into a place of harshness. There he says, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another? God must be faithful to his own name's sake. Well, not only that, God will provide for your life. He will direct your steps. But look at verse 4 now. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I will fear no evil. Uh, the Hebrew word translated as shadow of death literally means deep darkness, or deep, dark, gloomy dark darkness. Of course, one of the uh, very dark and gloomy paths that sometimes uh, that, well, we're all going to have to walk down it one day or another is the path of death. And that's not excluded here. But these paths of, of righteousness uh, and, and uh, these dark paths can be other than death be the path of a relationship gone sour, the path of a great disappointment, the loss of a job, maybe an illness that won't go away uh, for months or perhaps even years. But because Yahweh is your shepherd, no matter how dark those days are, he's right there with you to provide comfort protection. Sometimes as a pastor, uh, people 
will come to me for counsel with tears in their eyes because of some great trial that they're going through. And, and, and it just doesn't make any sense. And I have to tell them, I don't have an explanation for it. I, I don't know why you're having to go through this hard time. In the prime of your life, why are you being cut down by this terminal cancer? I don't know. I don't know the answer to some of these things. And maybe there is no human way of understanding them. Well, I may not understand the why, but I understand the who. And I know that God is our shepherd. I don't know why he leads us down certain paths of darkness and why we have to go through that trial and that difficulty. And, and I know, I know that there's some in this very room right now going through some very difficult, hard times. And maybe in your trials and maybe in those difficulties, you've been asking yourself a million times, Lord, why, why, why? God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my way your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sometimes, you know what? Our God is so great, we don't understand his mind. We don't understand all his ways. But we need to cling on to him because in, in Isaiah 46, verse 10, he declares this, that he knows the end from the beginning. And he says, my purpose will be established. I will accomplish all my good pleasures. Who can stay his hand? Who can stop him? I don't know the path. I don't know the reason for the darkness in the gloomy valley. But I know he knows. Don't you? I can trust in him in those dark and gloomy places. Because he loves me with an everlasting love. And he will not let me go. You know who George Matheson was? He was a, a, a Scottish uh, minister in the Church of Scotland in uh, the 19th century. He had a very promising career ahead of him. He was a very bright man, a very a gifted preacher. But uh, early in his ministry, he got engaged to a young woman, and then suddenly he started going blind. And eventually he went blind. But as he was going blind, his fiancée turned to him and says, George, I can't be married to a blind man. And she gave him back his ring. He was crushed. A blind man. Who's going to take care of me? Well, his sister took him in, but eventually his sister met somebody and she got married. And the eve of their marriage, he wrote that hymn that's in our book, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Sometimes we go through deep, deep dark. He will not let you go. That's the promise of your good shepherd. His rod and his staff provides comfort to us, a comfort beyond human explanation. The rod and staff are the weapons of the shepherd to ensure the safety and the protection of the sheep. In the green pastures, by the quiet waters, on the paths of righteousness, or even in the valley of darkness and gloom. He never leaves. He never forsakes. He's there to guide. He's there to protect. He's there to provide. It's interesting to me that the same young man who killed bears and, and lions and the giant named Goliath confessed in Psalm 56, verse 3, I am afraid. You know, there are real fears in life. About five or six weeks ago, uh, I, I had to go through radiation treatment for uh, some skin cancer, and they had to make this mask, and they put that mask over my head, and they fixed me to the table where I could not move, and suddenly I panicked. When I was a little kid, I had a dream of, of drowning, and that came to my mind. I had a dream of being buried alive, and that came to my mind. And here I am, unable to move. I panicked. But he will not let me go. There are real fears in life. It's not unspiritual to admit that. But David didn't stay in his fear. He went on to say, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, and I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? 
David couldn't stay in fear because his confidence was in his shepherd who will always protect and always defend. Years ago, my family, I took my family to Washington, D.C., and uh, we went to the uh, Vietnam Memorial. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's a very uh, emotional place for me. On that memorial, there are the names of several people that I know, two of them, uh, Colonel William Coltman, Captain Robert Brett. Uh, Captain Brett was my next door neighbor in Las Vegas. Colonel Coltman lived a few doors down. In September of 1972, they were deployed to Vietnam. And I was outside in the yard when the base commander and the chaplain came knocking on the door of Colonel Brett's house. And his young wife with a little baby in her arms answered the door, and I heard her scream. And then they went down the street to Colonel Colton's door. And there, the news that their F-111A had been shot down. The whole street was upset. These were great guys. Colonel Colton, we have these, these block barbecue parties. And, and Mr. Brett threw the football and the baseball around for all the kids. He was like a little kid himself in so many ways. A young man, 22, I think he was. Everyone was upset because these guys were long. But you know what stood out the most to me about that whole episode is that the Coltmans were Christian. They had a son older, uh, a year older and a daughter younger, a year younger than me. But Mrs. Coltman, when she heard that her, son, that her husband was shot down and at that time missing in action, later on declared killed in action, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And she went down and ministered to Mrs. Brett. I wasn't a Christian, but I remember her quoting this psalm and her calmness and her confidence in Yahweh taking her through very dark days worked a wonder in my heart until God converted me 18 months later. My friends, whenever you think God isn't there, whenever you think that he has abandoned you in your hardship, when darkness closes in and it seems to suffocate you then, even there, and my God is there with you. Psalm 139, verse 12 confesses, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Yes, he is there, his rod and his staff, comforting his people. Stand in confidence, even in darkness. Because he is your shepherd. He will provide for you through all the necessities. He will give you direction. He will give you purpose. And he will comfort your souls. This is the word of God. We come to verses 5 and 6. And I'm going to quickly come to an end here. But uh, we find the shepherd leading us out from the pasture through the valley into his own house. Where he has prepared a great feast in the presence of our enemies. There's trouble all around us on the valleys. There's trouble all around us in the fields. But God provides a lavish table where we can eat in perfect peace. Around the enemies waiting to pounce upon us like eager wolves. But for all that, in their presence, your God provides food to strengthen you. Here's a little lesson about the blessings and the importance of church and its worship, isn't it? When we gather Sunday by Sunday in the shepherd's name, he provides a lavish feast that comes from the overflow of his gracious provisions. Oh, my friends, may we bask in the blessed knowledge of Philippians 4.19 that my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Well, Notice that he just doesn't uh, supply the need, but that he anoints your head with oil. My cup overflows. Sometimes we ask the question, do you see the cup as half empty or half full? My friends, with God, it's neither. With God, it's overflowing. David started off the psalm saying that God takes care of the necessities. Then he takes you through the dark valleys, through the hard times. He meets your needs there. But now he finally takes you to his house and he says, come on in. <laughs> I've got more than you can imagine. Don't you love that, that statement that Paul has in 1 Corinthians 1 where he quotes Isaiah? 
and he says, eye hasn't seen it, ear hasn't heard it, nor has it even entered in the mind of man those things that God has prepared for those who love him. Your bank account, no matter how full it is, is of limited resources. If it had six trillion dollars, it's still limited. But God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, which means to say that he owns everything. There's never been a time in which our God could say, I wish I could give my people these great gifts, but you know what? I've run out. He says, I don't have the resources anymore. He's never gone bankrupt. Ephesians chapter 3 should challenge our faith. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think. Now I can think some pretty big thoughts. He's able to reach beyond that. Do you hear the invitation then to prayer, the promise? You'll have everything you need and then some. Because God is your shepherd, and he's your host. And when this host is abundantly, uh, or infinitely abundant in his resources, and when he has shown you his love by sending you his son to die on the cross for you, to raise him from the dead, and when he has promised you good, why do we live as beggars, I wonder? When he says that our cup overflows, why are we so afraid to ask him for big things? Do you think he can't provide? My cup overflows. Let's go to him this year and asking him to, to give us big things. Sometimes we think, again, God is just waiting for us to make mistakes so he can clobber us. Or that he is so stingy that he wants us to beg from him. And my friends, if we have that view of him, we will not be confident. Psalm 23 teaches us that God, in fact, is not an ogre. He's a good shepherd. And I have an assurance that because God's son stepped out of glory, he took on human flesh with all its weaknesses and miseries. He, he did this to make me his child, to make you his child. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, my own know me, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You question whether or not the good shepherd loves you? He died for you, willingly went to the cross for you. How much more can he give you than his own life? My friends, listen. If he gave up his life voluntarily, do you think that he will condemn you? That's, that's the reasoning the apostle had in Romans chapter 8. Do you think that he will beat you up when you fall? No. Romans 8, 1 says, now there's no condemnation. Psalm 23 teaches us about God and his salvation. And so in Christ's name, it exhorts us to live in this world with confidence and with Christian boldness. You know who William Carey was? Missionary to India. He went to India with his family as a missionary. And there he met with all kinds of hardships. Met with malaria, bankruptcy. One of his own sons died. His wife went insane, chased him around with a knife. William Carey wrote, Indeed, this is the valley of the shadow of death to me. But I rejoice that I am here notwithstanding and God is here. He wasn't there alone in all those trials. Remember, he lived by that motto. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. And through the pain, he continued on seeking God's blessings, and the blessings came. You know that story. You know that despite the presence of terrible enemies and of uh, 18 missionary posts were established, the scriptures were translated into 30 Indian dialects. And eventually he had 50 fellow missionaries laboring with him. 14 missionary societies were established on his model. God is my shepherd. I shall not want. Not only will I not want, I will have an overflow. Here it is, my friend, Psalm 23. Let it, let it carry us in through the new year. God provides, God guides, God abides. His cup overflows. 
he anoints with the oil of the Holy Spirit. Now, it could be, it could be that maybe your faith today can't expect great things from God. But you can walk with him in at least small things. God's love is demonstrated completely and fully in the person and the work of your good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And if he is for you, my friends, who could be against you? If God delivered him up for us all, will he not freely give us all other things? Those aren't my words. That's the word of scripture. His cup overflows. Don't forget this. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that we have a good shepherd in Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. And we thank you, O Lord, that he carries us through all the dark paths into green valleys, cool waters, but even beyond that, into your presence. We thank you that we have this promise that you have spread a, a tremendous feast, a tremendous meal, and that you supply all our needs and our wants, but, oh, Lord, still our faith wonders, our, our faith shakes. We wonder, oh, Lord, is this real? Are your promises true? I pray, O oh Father, that you will make this psalm become a living reality in all our lives so that at the end of 2020, when we're looking to 2021, we can say, Yahweh is our shepherd. We shall not want. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.